Well, the Extreme Rules pay-per-view is in the books, and because I pride myself on being timely, I'll be posting this two days after the event. Okay, I just didn't want to post two videos up on one day. I already have my random trade review up for Monday, so this will be up on Tuesday. And... <sighs> Sorry for the stilted talk here. I'm a little sleep-deprived. I've been up since 3 o'clock this morning, because I... Uh, if you haven't seen any of my other wrestling uh, pay-per-view videos, uh, a lot of times on Sundays I'm out of my house and I'm not really able to watch the pay-per-view live. So I have to watch the next day. Oh. Mm. Excuse me. Sorry. Try and stay awake as best as I can right now. Which actually is kind of fitting given the... Uh, lead up to this pay-per-view because there just didn't seem to be much excitement going in and I think because of that it actually turned out to be a rather decent pay-per-view. Not spectacular by any stretch of the imagination but you know most of the matches were pretty good. You know um, starting things off on the uh, kickoff show or the pre-show or uh, whatever they call it now. I guess it's the kickoff show. Uh, we had a match change. Uh, Daniel Bryan was injured, obviously. That's been the news, and he was unable to defend the Intercontinental title. And so they basically changed the Bad News Barrett Daniel Bryan match to a match between Bad News Barrett and Adrian Neville. And then they switched that around with the tag team title match, which was originally going to be on the kickoff show and is now part of the main show. Um, Anyway, obviously, uh, both uh, Bad News Barrett and Neville were introduced, and the funny thing is, both wrestlers wear capes, which I have to wonder, is this now becoming a trend with the UK wrestlers? <laughs> um, early on, uh, Neville tried one of his high-flying maneuvers to the outside of the, from uh, with a springboard, maybe a moonsault of some sort, but uh, Barrett managed to come up and catch him, and uh, basically chop-blocked him, and Neville's, the back of Neville's head hit the uh, corner of the ring apron. Um, they went, then went into an ad break, because there's an ad break during the free-for-all. And uh, by that point, uh, Barrett was kind of hit down, dominating the match throughout most of it. Um, there's a couple points. Uh, Neville got an enziguri in. He then hit, got another springboard uh, move in. Or, uh, what was it on the springboard? It was dive over the top rope to the outside of the ring. Uh, eventually, uh, Barrett hit the winds of change for a uh, two count. Uh, Barrett went uh, for Wasteland uh, twice. On the first occasion, Neville managed to counter out of it. The second time, uh, Barrett hit it and I only got a two count out of it. Uh, Barrett went to the no for a bull hammer and Neville countered with an enziguri. Neville went for his finisher, the Red Arrow, and. Uh, Barrett actually managed to get up and counter that and crotched Neville in the t turnbuckle pad. Uh, then Barrett went for another bull hammer, but Neville uh, dodged out of the way, came back down, and uh, managed to kick Barrett upside the head. And this allowed Neville to finally hit the red arrow for the win. And uh, with that, we move on to. Yeah, again, I have to use notes for these things. <clears throat> and now as we move on to the pay-per-view proper, starting off with the Dean Ambrose, Luke Harper, Chicago Street Fight. And what makes a Chicago different, a sh uh, yeah. yeah, sorry, what makes a Chicago Street Fight better than an uh, ordinary street fight? Well, it's in Chicago. Think about it. <laughs> uh, anyway, there was actually this little moment in, uh, before during the kickoff show, kind of leading into the uh, the Harper Ambrose fight, where uh, Dean Ambrose came on, uh, started cutting a paper, uh, cutting a promo for the thing, but uh, he came onto the pre-show with uh, Renee Young and Byron Saxton, uh, Booker T, and Corey Graves, and uh, <laughs> you know to, he tried to cut a promo with the PA mic, and it, exact for some reason the mic just wouldn't turn on. It's like you could hear him; he was yelling just loud enough that the mic the uh, recording equipment for the uh, cameras and stuff was able to pick him up. I don't think anyone else in the arena, he kept trying to get people to cheer, and like, 
to cheer along with them, the only people who were cheering, I think, were the people who were in earshot. So uh, it was kind of weird. <laughs> anyway, uh, starting off the fight, uh, Ambrose jumped Harper on the entrance ramp, and they started throwing it. Uh, throws he threw. God. Again, I'm really tired, folks. I'm sorry about that. Uh, he threw Harper into the ring steps. Uh, Ambrose uh, then started throwing chairs into the ring. He went under the ring. He started throwing chairs into the ring. Uh, then I think Harper started... Th Ambrose threw chairs into the ring. Harper threw chairs into the ring, too. And then uh, brought a kendo stick into the ring. Uh, Harper was then able to manage to suplex Ambrose onto one of the chairs. Yeah, someone's walking around upstairs, sorry. Uh, the two began fighting around in the ring. Oh, uh, wait, there was another spot, too, where uh, Harper mounted a chair in the corner and then uh, basically uh, tossed Ambrose in, head first into the chair in the corner. Then the two kind of uh, began fighting outside the ring again. They made their way to the back. Uh, all along the way, uh, Ambrose was beating Harper with a Kendro stick. Uh, then Harper, there was an SUV, this, uh, black, uh, boy, what was it? It was a GMC, it wasn't a GMC, Jimmy, I'm trying to think, it was a GMC SUV of some kind. And, yeah, Harper gets in and starts trying to drive away. Ambrose chases and manages to jump into the passenger side, and the, uh, car just sort of zooms off, and the crowd starts booing because obviously they wanted an end of the match. And, uh, the, exactly. We then cut to backstage, and Triple H begins to send Kane off to catch Ambrose and, uh, Harper, and then Seth Rollins shows up, and we get all that angle leading into the main event. Which, yeah, yeah, but... It was really kind of a disappointing, because it just screeched, to a, it screeched this opening match to a halt, which was a... Pretty entertaining, but uh, again, they start doing the uh, Roddy Piper Gold Dust uh, Backlot Brawl shtick. Uh, obviously, we'll be revisiting that street fight a little bit later, but they then went on to the second match, which was the Sheamus versus Dolph Ziggler Kiss Me Arse match. Uh, to start things off, uh, Ziggler and Sheamus were fighting outside the ring, and uh, Ziggler managed to hit a swinging DDT off of the ring steps. Uh, Sheamus then uh, fought back, was knocking um, knocking Ziggler into the corner. God, I'm sorry again, folks. I'm really trying to hear it. Uh, he was fighting Ziggler into the corner, and uh, I think he was trying to go for a broke kick, but he really hit more of a running knee lift, so it looked more like a broke knee instead of a broke kick. Uh, Sheamus then hit a sit-down power, power bomb for a two-count. Uh, Sheamus then locked into a clover leaf, but Ziggler, blech, Ziggler was able to counter it into a roll-up for two. Uh, then Sheamus went for a suplex attempt, and Ziggler countered it into a small package and got the three-count. This means that uh, Seamus had to kiss Ziggler's butt, but uh, Seamus did his darndest to try to wiggle out of it, and eventually he began to kneel down, prepare himself to kiss Ziggler on his butt cheek, but then low blowed Ziggler, and then hit a broke kick on Ziggler, and then he made Ziggler kiss his butt cheek. Yeah, that was a that was a real dead of a match, and to be honest, well, I wasn't expecting much of it anyway. Uh, anyway, match three, we have the tag team titles on the line, the Brass Ring Club, Kid and Cesaro, Masters of the WWE Universe, uh, wherever they're calling themselves these days, uh, versus the New Day, and, you know, uh, they're trying to push uh, Kid and Cesaro's faces now, and they're trying to get over this, uh, them spouting how great they are, and then stating, that's a fact. And I guess they're trying to get that to be a good catchphrase, and it's not really working very well. <laughs> I just let them wrestle. That's enough to get them over as baby faces, really. Um, anyway, uh, the tag team they're facing, the New Day, three members. 
Uh, in this case, they're facing uh, Kofi and Big E for the bit, uh, representing the New Day in the match. Um, there were some interesting spots in this part. Uh, most notably, uh, the one I could think of is they're preparing for a uh, Kofi Kingston suicide dive outside the ring onto Tyson Kidd, but uh, the way it was set up, I think Kofi was going to springboard off of uh, Big E, but uh, the way Big E was standing allowed Tyson Kidd to actually crawl into the ring through uh, Big E's legs and cut Kofi off the pass. Uh, there was another point where, uh, again, Tyson Kidd was on the ring apron. Big E speared uh, Tyson Kidd through the ring apron. Kidd flew into the ring barricade really hard. It was a, like I said, it was a bad, it was a, well, it was a bad, badass spear. It just big bump out of the whole bunch, and uh, the big stunner here is the New Day actually won, um, Xavier Woods distracted the referee, uh, Natalia came over and stopped him from distracting the referee, but it was just enough for uh, Cesaro to turn around, distract his attention to, and that allowed Kofi to get the roll up in the kit and the three count for the pin. And the New Day are now tag team champions, and then backstage, they are trying to get their uh, New Day chant. Which it, it was new day, new ch yeah, new day, new champs. New, of course, the crowd starts going, new day sucks, new day sucks, <laughs> and then they get interrupted by the SUV returning, which means it's time now for the conclusion of the Harper Ambrose street fight. Uh, there's this point where uh, Ambrose leapt off the roof of the car and onto the New Day. Harper dodged out of the way. Um, the two began fighting their way back to the ring. Uh, Harper powerbombed Ambrose on a pile of chairs because there was this point, too, where they started to get back to the ring and both men just start throwing chairs into the ring. There's this big pile of chairs. I guess they're doing their homage to ECW on that. Uh, if I guess most of you are probably aware of the uh, incident in ECW. I think it was... It was Terry Funk, I know that. I'm trying to think of the other one was. I want to say Cactus Jack was involved, too. And Funk uh, famously got the microphone, asked for a chair, said, I need a chair, I need a chair. Someone threw a chair into the ring, and then someone else threw a chair in the ring, and then someone else threw a chair in the ring, and then suddenly, like, all these chairs just started raining into the ring. Chair after chair after chair. It kind of looked like that, except in this case, both wrestlers were throwing the chairs into the ring. And then, uh... Then, yeah, like I said, Harper then powerbombed Ambrose onto the pile of chairs. Uh, only got a two count out of it. Um, Harper then began burying Ambrose in the chair. He, Harper went to the top rope to do a move. Ambrose got out of the pile of chairs. Uh, I can't remember if he ran into the turnbuckle or not, but uh, managed to block Harper's move. Harper came down from the turnbuckle. Ambrose hit the dirty deeds on the chairs for the win. And now I need a quick drink. Okay, our fourth match is the Russian Chain match for the United States Championship between Rusev and John Cena. Um, and now, the way this is set up, it's basically it's your average strap slash chain slash rope bull rope match where the two competitors are attached by, in this case, a chain. And the goal is you have to basically incapacitate the, you know, one of the wrestlers has to incapacitate the other and then touch all four turnbuckles in a sequence. And now they have lights mounted up like, they look like uh, hockey goal lights. Where touch, it said there were two lights, there was a green one for Cena and a red one for Rusev. And you have to touch each of them and there will be a light to go off whenever they had been touched and see, yeah. <clears throat> so... Yeah, sorry for getting rambly, but you get the idea anyway. Anyway, uh, funny thing is, early on, like, uh, Rusev and Cena lock up. Rusev takes Cena, pushes him back into the turnbuckle as Cena's light goes off because he touched the turnbuckle. Funny thing is, Rusev then goes over, he slaps the turnbuckle, but the light doesn't go off. Instead, the light in a different corner went off. Um, basically, you know, if you watch a wrestling event, you know, the, pretend for the sake of this argument, the, my hands here are the ring. 
this was the corner that Cena was thrown into. And then Rusev touched in this corner, but the light in this corner actually went off. <laughs> uh, it was kind of funny. Um, but anyway, they managed to get that light fi fiasco fixed up. And um, uh, at one point, Rusev tried a top rope move, but for some reason his light didn't go off. Technically, he touches the turnbuckle if he's climbing the ropes, doesn't it? Uh, anyway, um, then there was this weird point in the middle of the match where... I guess the fans were starting to chant for Lana. I don't know. I didn't even really hear them chant for Lana that much, except she then climbed up on the ring apron and started waving to the fans. And this angered Rusev, and he sent her to the back for the rest of the match. Um, and again, the problem with a lot of strap matches is they always seem to have the exact same ending, which is one competitor starts touching the corners of the turnbuckle. Yeah. Then the other competitor starts touching the turnbuckles just behind them, or likewise in the same sequence. And then it's down to this one turnbuckle that they got to touch, and it's a race between the two, and then one of them inherently will win. Uh, this time they actually did it a little differently. Um, like, again, pretend my hands are the ring. Like, Rusev started on this one. No, no, Rusev started on this one. Cena started on this one. And so it went, like, no, no. Bruce has started on this one. Cena started on this one. Sorry again, folks. Uh, you know, like, Rusev touched, Cena touched, Ru uh, Rusev touched, Cena touched, then Rusev touched, and then it left him down to this last one. Cena and Rusev both start charging towards it. Cena manages to catch Rusev, hit him with the AA, and then he touches the back corner one. Ru uh, Cena retains with the title. Uh, not really a big shot. This was like I said, a pretty good match, although, again, if you've ever seen a, a strap match of that kind, or a strap match, chain match, bull rope match, it's always the same finish, you can tell. And that was kind of the one thing that held back from it. And then, um, I don't remember if this happened before the next match or not, but uh, backstage, there was like a bunch of vignettes, and then backstage, uh, Rusev and Lana were arguing or something, and uh, Rusev screams in Russian to go do something, and then Lana goes into the authorities' dressing room. Yeah. <clears throat> Sorry. And, uh, you know, I thought, well, I'll have an announcement on Raw tonight or something, so I thought, well, well man, I'm going to have to, like, cut here and explain what's going to happen, but, um, no, um, that announcement came after... Uh, it came later on the pay-per-view. I can't remember exactly when it came, but yeah. Uh, the next pay-per-view, Payback, on May 17th, we will have the final Rusev-John Cena match, and this one will be an I Quit match, which, to be honest, really should have been this match. I, like I said, I think an I Quit match would have been a better fit for uh, this pay-per-view, but like I said, I was still pretty pleased with the uh, Cena-Rusev match. Uh, much to the chagrin of all the Cena bashers out there. Um, you know, the funny thing is, bashing Cena has gotten so in vogue, it's now, I think, coming back a little bit. Like, the whole idea of the Cena bashing was because Cena was always winning, WWE kept trying to force Cena down everyone's throats, they stay uh, out, the IWIX, the internet wrestling community started retaliating against that, and, you know, technically they were right, exactly, like, Cena was sort of being forced down everyone's throats, uh, it was very annoying, but I think now there's been so much of that stuff, it's coming back around so that it's like, uh, you know, guys, the Cena hate isn't really worth it that much. You know, you can have a very well-reasoned argument if you keep making the stupid argument all the dang time. At some point, the person you're trying to convince is going to turn to you and say, shut up. <laughs> anyway. I digress. Uh, on to the next match. We have the Divas Championship on the line. Nikki Bella versus uh, Naomi. And, uh, yeah, give Divas a chance, give Divas a chance, and we open up with the commentators talking about uh, Naomi's shoes, which had these, like, touchpad glow light-up things, and they changed. They were dark, they were light green to start the match, and then they were dark green, and then at one point they changed to blue. And, uh, yeah, that was about it. <laughs> uh, there were actually a couple of good points in this match. Uh, there was a point, um, 
Naomi hit a running bulldog on Nikki into the corner turnbuckle. Uh, got a two count out of it. Uh, Nikki went for the rack attack finisher and uh, Naomi, Naomi countered it into a full Nelson bomb and got a two count out of that. Um, then Nikki managed to distract the ref while Bree kicked Naomi in the head. This allowed Nikki to hit the rack attack for the win. And why did the, does Nikki win? Because the Bellas are the only divas that matter. I, I've seen this for, you know, basically three out of the last four pay-per-views. The Bellas always win. <sighs> Again, you keep pushing these contenders like they're threats to the Bellas, and now you're turning the Bellas into baby faces, and they still win by cheating. Yeah. Yeah, it does kind of hold this match back a little bit. Just a sec here. I'm sorry, there's someone doing some work outside my window, but it's not outside a window that I can easily close the door to and cut the noise with, so uh, you're just going to have to deal with it for the rest of this recap. On to match six, which is the big show on Roman Reigns in the last man standing match. Um, a lot of people are saying this is the match that sold the show. Uh, I actually prefer the Cena Rusev match a little bit better myself, but this match was still pretty good. You know, um, you know, they went back and forth. It's last man standing, so there's no pinfall or submission. It's basically a knockout. <clears throat> uh, at one point, Reigns put out a ta pulled out a table, and then Big Show took the table and basically put it back under the ring. Uh, Reigns then took out a kendo stick and started heating on the Big Show. Uh, you know, Big Show fought back. Reigns hit DDT, uh, DDT on a chair for the Big Show. Uh, show hit the K the knockout punch. I got an eight out of it. Reigns hit a Samoan drop on a table that he had set up. Uh, got in like another eight count or so. Uh, Reigns hit the Superman punch and then <clears throat> oh he hit two Superman punches in a row and then he got choke slammed through it. But then uh, Show fought back and Choke Slam out of the ring and threw two tables. Uh, Show then took the ring steps and set them up next to the announce table, trying to set for something there. We don't know what his plan was because uh, at one point, uh, they Show and Reigns were fighting again. Reigns got on the yeah, the announce table. Show got on the announce table. It started a tip over. This is not the Spanish announce table. This is the regular announce table. Uh, Show managed to throw Reigns off, but Reigns regained his footing just enough. He got on, ran up the ring steps, spears Big Show off of the regular announce table, on, and through the Spanish announce table. And yet, this still wasn't enough as Big Show started to get back up. Reigns came in. I think he hit another Superman punch. And then uh, he took the regular announce table and basically lifted it, rolled it over onto the big show, and used that to keep him down for a 10 count. Um, the funny thing is, uh, I, like I said, that ending has happened before. That actually happened in the Alberto Del Rio big show uh, World Heavyweight Championship match. Uh, it was a last man standing match. Uh, but like I said, this was a real good match. You could argue that it stole the show. Excuse me again. There, I think I'm, I closed one of my doors there. I think that's going to help a little bit with the noise. I don't know how much. Uh, okay, so... Um, just before the main event, we had this uh, little... I, I wouldn't even call it a squash match in the strictest sense of the term. It was just... Uh, there was no ref. and um, Bo Dallas comes out. He starts cutting uh, this heel promo. He's like... Chicago is number one. Chicago is number one in most unbathed individuals. If you just take the shower and learn to believe. And then uh, Ryback comes out. He comes out, he basically hits a bunch of power moves on Bo Dallas, hits him, uh, shell shocks him, and then that was it. Um, the unique thing is, um, the big rumor right now is that Ryback is going to be having a feud with Bray Wyatt. And uh, recently, Bo Dallas has grown this goatee out of nowhere, and everyone's hating it. No one, and, but it has led people to wonder, are we going to get a new incarnation of the Wyatt family with Bray Wyatt and Bo Dallas? 
and maybe Luke Harper rejoining, or Eric Rowan, I don't know. Uh, it would be kind of funny, I guess, because obviously Bray Wyatt and Bo Dallas are brothers. <laughs> are they going to re reveal that, or are they just going to do something and not make any reference to it? Because it's kind of hard, because they have the same face. They have the same eye. Again, they're brothers, but they do have, I think, the same eyes and the same nose. Obviously, Bray Wyatt's a little bigger, but uh, just a unique observation there. And uh, that leads into the final match of the evening. Seth Rollins versus Randy Orton. World Heavyweight Championship match inside a steel cage, but the RKO is banned. And Kane is the gatekeeper for the steel cage. Um... Starting off the match right away, Rollins immediately started climbing up the cage, but of course this doesn't work. Orton was able to catch him. Uh, Rollins then hit a knee from the top rope on Orton's head, got a two count out of it. Orton hits a power slam off the top rope for a two count. Uh, it was about this time that J&J &J Security, who didn't come out with Rollins at first, uh, they then came down to the ring and began interjecting themselves. Uh, as Rollins was trying to climb over the cage, they tried to come down and pull Rollins down, but Orton was able to pull Rollins back into the cage and a superplex off the cage. Uh, got a two count on it. J&J Security then uh, started trying to coerce Kane into opening up the cage and letting them in. <clears throat> Kane wasn't having any of it. He basically scared them back. So Mercury and Noble each tried to climb up opposite sides of the cage, but... Orton was able to grab Rollins and whip him into the cage and knock j, j security down. And that was about the last time they were really relevant at all in this match. <clears throat> uh, Orton began to set up uh, Rollins for the RKO, but then, out of nowhere, changed it into a pedigree. And he hit the pedigree, but only got a two count on it. Orton then went for the punt kick, but all, Rollins rolled out of the way. And then Orton hit another move. I want to say it was his, uh, his Hangman's DDT, but I may be wrong on that. It's a little fuzzy. And uh, Orton then tried to exit through the cage door because Kane had opened the cage door because both... Uh, Rollins had called for the cage door to open, but then Orton had managed to uh, stop Rollins before he could make it towards anywhere near the cage door. It was sitting open. Orton started to walk out through the cage door, but then Kane didn't even slam it. He just kind of closed it and locked the door, and door back into his face, back into Orton's face. <clears throat> Excuse me. But before uh, Kane could lock the door, Orton or Rollins tried to hit a running drop kick. Orton dodged out of the way. Uh, Rollins drop kicked the cage door, knocked Kane off the ring steps, and down. Door was open. <clears throat> uh, Kane then got up, got angry, as both Rollins and Orton were trying to work their way through the cage door. Kane grabbed the cage door, slammed it onto both of them, knocking both Orton and Rollins back. Kane then got up, entered the ring, started to go towards Rollins, giving the sign for the choke slam, but then turned his attention to Orton, choke slammed Orton, then turned and choke slammed Rollins. And then kind of sat there, just sort of, you know, this weird torn between two lovers moment. And uh, eventually he grabs or he grabbed Rollins, pulled him onto Orton. Ref goes down. One, two. Orton kicks out. Kane and exited the ring at this point. Turns around, goes back inside the ring, starts signaling for the tombstone. Orton goes out, and he starts, he picks up Orton, starts trying to deliver the tombstone, Orton counters, hits an RKO, and the announcer's like, oh, but the RKO is banned. I was like, well, it's banned for use on Rollins, it's not banned for the use on Kane. But as uh, Kane got, as Orton, not Kane, Orton, Orton got up from the RK, hitting the RKO on Kane, Rollins turned around and hit an RKO on Orton. Technically, that should have ended the match by disqualification. But that wasn't the case. Instead, Rollins turned around and escaped the cage for the win. Still maintaining the title. No real shock here. They weren't going to take the belt off of Orton. Uh, not of Orton. 
uh, for Rollins so soon after he had just won it. Again, no real shock, but uh, I guess the one thing that doesn't still doesn't make any sense is why not just call DQ on Rollins for the win? <laughs> exactly, it's, it would have mattered because the title can't change hands on a disqualification, so who cares if Rollins got disqualified? And uh, obviously it's kind of means that I guess they're going to look towards setting up a triple threat match at Payback with Kane, uh, Rollins, and Orton. Uh, yeah, that sounds really exciting, doesn't it? Uh, don't know what else to do. I guess they're going to do another big show Roman Reigns match. Um, wouldn't be too bad, but again, we've already had that now. This is like the fourth or fifth uh, big show Roman Reigns match, so I don't know how great that's necessarily going to be. Um, I'm guessing uh, Harper and uh, Ambrose will be continuing their feud. Like I said, the other uh, big feud rumor is Ryback and Bray Wyatt. Don't know if that's going to turn out any, any good. Uh, New Day with the tag team titles. I expect Brass Ring Club is going to challenge them for, again on Raw tonight. Don't know if they'll win them back, but uh, they'll probably face again at the pay-per-view because uh, last time I checked, um, Jimmy Uso is still out. <clears throat> and uh, admittedly, it's with uh, Naomi going heel now, i got to wonder how... Uh... Excuse me. Mm. Mm. Excuse me. <sighs> with uh, with Naomi going heel, I do have to wonder how uh, how this is going to work with the Uso since you know, she's married to Jimmy and there's a J. Yeah, great. Even I'm confusing them now. I know Jimmy's the one who's out. And you know, when the Usos come back, are they going to be heels now or not? Because uh, there's a real dearth of babyface tag teams. I mean, New Day are basically heels now. Uh, Los Matadores have been acting kind of heelish. You know, Brass Ring Club, while I think they people cheer them, they're not really babyfaces in the strictest sense of the term. So, uh, I guess there's some interesting things coming out of that. Um, like I say, overall, this really wasn't a big waste, and it looked on paper like it was going to be a big waste, but uh, it turned out to be a really good pay-per-view. I uh, obviously wish Daniel Bryan could have competed too, but, you know, he's hurt. And uh, At first they said it was a snack, and then they said it was a concussion, but um, WWE's not really talking right now. Don't know how that's going to turn out. But, uh, like I said, I mean, it does seem to be building some feuds for the future, and that's a good thing. And, uh... Um, I guess the other kind of big announcement is that uh, the King of the Ring is coming back. Um, I guess they're going to hold the quarterfinals tonight on Raw, and then the semifinals will be on the semifinals and final will be on Tuesday. So uh, I'll have to cover that, and um, then towards the end of the week, obviously uh, Marvel Avengers: Age of Ultron is coming out. Uh, don't know when I'm going to be able to see that exactly. I'm aiming for uh, Saturday. So that's probably going to be the earliest I can uh, I can go see it. Or, well, to be honest, my, <clears throat> sorry, I'm trying to rephrase that as best as I can. Uh, the earliest I can probably go see it um, because that's probably when I'll have the finances to go see it. Is going to be Saturday. Um, until then, uh, see you next time. Bye.